It is a privilege for me to introduce Professor John Swinton. He is one whose work I have come to appreciate in the last year or so, and now in these last few days has become a friend. And so it is a pleasure to be in this session to introduce him and, and to welcome you all here. John Swinton is Chair in Divinity and Religious Studies and Professor in Practical Theology and Pastoral Care at King's College at the University of Aberdeen. Additionally, he is the founder of the Center for Spirituality, Health, and Disability. Trained originally as a nurse, he worked in the field of mental health and learning disabilities um, before serving for a number of years as a hospital chaplain. It is out of this background in caring for the mentally ill and disabled, as well as his own sense of pastoral calling that Professor Swinton developed his research interest in considering the place of, of faith and community in the process of healing. Particularly in his role as a chaplain with the mentally ill, he began to formulate his theological emphases. I want to quote from his autobiography on his University of Aberdeen page. It was whilst working in these fields that I began to gain a passion for developing modes of care that are genuinely person-centered and which take seriously the significance of theology, spirituality, and religion within the processes of healing and community building. Professor Swinton's work is born out of his own experience of caring for persons faced with the challenge of mental illness and disability. His is not a dry theology divorced from the realities of everyday life. His theology is a reflection on practice, but it is also, as the very best work of theology does, it seeks to offer instruction for practice based on reflection, recognizing that the richness of the Christian tradition holds a needed witness for the, of hope for those confronting disability and mental illness. His books include Resurrecting the Person, Friendship and the Care of People with Mental Health Problems, Spirituality in Mental Health Care, Recovering a Forgotten Dimension, and most recently an edited volume with Brian Brock, Theology, Disability, and the New Genetics, Why Science Needs the Church. Professor Swinton's title this afternoon is The Sacrament of the Present Moment, Christian Spirituality, Dignity, and the Care of People with Advanced Dementia. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor John Swinton. Well, thank you, Donna. That's very kind of you. Um, before, I, uh, before I begin, I've noticed that some of you guys speak with strange accents. <laughs> so when you're asking questions, I want you to be really speak slowly, take your time, take deep breaths so I can understand you. The <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to get the opportunity to speak with you about some, I thought, important things around an area that's fundamentally important for us all, both in terms, I'm sure, of people that we know, but also in terms of ourselves, because we get old, we uh, begin to become frail. The issues that we're talking about apply to all of us. And so the key theological and practical questions I want to talk about you today are yours, as well as theirs, whoever they may be. Um, before I, I begin to get into some of the issues, can anybody tell me what the word uh, dissonance means? Dissonance. You Americans are not very clever, are you? Tension. Not like us. Tension. Tension. But tension would be a good way of putting it. Dissonance occurs when you expect to see one thing and you see something else, and it creates an inner, an inner psychological tension. So, for example, when you see a handsome Afro-Caribbean man standing before you, and he talks with a Scottish accent, you experience <laughs> dissonance. Now, I'm not sure which part of that you're laughing at. But we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with a positive interpretation. Um, and I want, in a sense, to kind of create dissonance around the issue of dementia, and in particular, dementia care, to help us to, to think a little bit differently and to allow issues to rise themselves up that make us uncomfortable but push us towards uh, improved practice. Because I'm, I'm a practical theologian. Uh, and a practical theology, put simply, is theological reflection on the practices of the church as they interact with the practices of the world with a view to enabling faithfulness. In other words, practical theology looks not just at what theology is as concepts and ideas, but looks at what theology looks like when it's embodied within individuals and within the community. Uh, and I want to kind of go with that today. I want us to, to develop some conceptual things and to think through some things 
But I want, most importantly, perhaps, to look at what theology looks like when it, when it comes into our bodies, when we begin to, to live it out in that way. Now, I've chosen the title Christian Spirituality, Dignity and the Care of People with Advanced Dementia because there's a bit of confusion. This may be a, 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 a European problem and not American problem. But there's a bit of confusion over what spirituality is. Where we are, spirituality covers everything, and because it covers everything, it ends up covering nothing. And so I'm particularly interested in locating spirituality within the Christian tradition. That's one of the things, as Darren says, that we do uh, in our, my own university. But that's what I want to do today. What is it that Christian spirituality has to offer to our understanding, and Christian theology and spirituality has to understanding, particularly of people with advanced dementia, i.e. people who have forgotten who they are? People who have got to that stage where, uh, according to the criteria of uh, society, they've lost their personhood. And I want to offer a challenge to that. And I want to try and rethink and reframe what we mean by personhood, what we mean by soul, and what we mean by uh, living well, even in the midst of dementia. And so the question, of course, is what is dementia? At one level, Dementia is clearly a neurological condition that affects the brain in particular ways and causes, uh, amongst other things, serious memory loss. But dementia, like... I'm sorry to, to disturb you, but sure. is there any way you could move your podium over a little bit? I, I don't know. Because, no, the reason that the, there's a problem with my wire. Uh, sorry. No, no, no. I, 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 can, I could be wherever you want me to be. Am I blocking your <laughs> yeah, screen? I just can't see it. Some other right. can't yeah. well, as long as you can see me, that's the blessing in itself. <laughs> <laughs> but can, can we, can we, we shuffle around a little bit? We can try. Right, we, we do have cord and power issues is the one problem yeah. on how we, we have a limited length of cord to get him where he needs to be. Well, okay. <laughs> Maybe on the other side. Instead of leaving the podium where it is and just taking the microphone and moving a little, and then you can just reach back to pull down on the slide. Or just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't want you to, to miss out on that. Well, then I'm decentered. I, I, I feel as if I'm not the center of, attra of attraction for people. <laughs> that would never do. We oh, should try to do this. It over. All right. Good. Okay. So, dementia. I always this feels kind of strange, though. I feel. Like I kind of dislocate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right, I'm staying here, so. Dementia, like any other illness or any other condition, is a social construct in the sense that as soon as it, whether it's neurological or whether it's, it's, it's uh, psychological, as soon as it enters into culture, it becomes a cultural object within which people interpret it in a variety of different ways. And even the neurological definition of dementia is open to critique. If you read the work of Tom Kipwood in particular, he suggests that, and we'll talk about this perhaps later rather than be going into just now, that although uh, uh, dementia looks neurological, actually there's a very serious and significant psychological and sociological component that can't be separated from it. So even that which seems obvious and neurological actually is not. And I use this passage here just as a way of illustrating that point, because Take the life of Jesus. Jesus, who is God, comes into the world and has multiple interpretations. Some people saw him as Messiah, some people saw him as a criminal, some people saw him as, and so on and so forth. But the key thing is that the way in which you interpret and put meaning to a concept will determine the way that you respond towards it. And one of the things that we'll see as we move on is that the way in which people interpret dementia is profoundly negative, and that negativity determines the way we respond to it, and that response determines the type of life that people will explore. But not simply the type of life that people with dementia will experience and explore, but the type of life that all of us do. In other words, misinterpretation of human experience leads to misinterpretation of all of our experiences. Tom Kitwood. Um, puts it like this. He says, Our understanding of dementia has been constructed by a cluster of discourses uh, 
of which the dominant one is grounded in medical science. Within this interpretative framework, the person is totally subsumed to the new logical condition, even to the point where linguistically they're frequently referred to as dead. So people talk about people with dementia as, as zombies, as living dead, as walking dead, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's something to do with the power of the biomedical model within our culture. If you think about it, it's almost impossible to talk about health and illness without first talking about medicine. That tells you something very important about the power that medicine has in shaping our ideas. Now, I want today to think about what a, what a theological perspective might add to that. My, my point is not that medicine is wrong, and my point is not that the new logical uh, understanding should be discarded. My point is that both are inadequate. And if we begin to think theologically, perhaps our practices will change in response. So what does it mean to be yourself? I mean, turn to the person beside you and ask, how do you know who you are? It's a complicated question. <laughs> it says, the more I think, the more confused I get. Um, I want us to begin with that question, how do you know who you are? Because one of the key features and one of the key fears that people have when they encounter dementia is that you'll forget yourself, that you'll somehow lose yourself because of this illness. And the first proposition I want to put to, 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 to you is, you probably don't know who you are anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you just think that you do. Okay. So let me just unpack that a little bit. Um, Stephen Sabat, in a book that you should read if you're interested in this area, called The Experience of Alzheimer's Disease. And what he's, does, uh, he's done is, through a series of in-depth qualitative interviews with people who have advanced dementia, began to, ch began to challenge this idea that you lose yourself, even in the advanced stages of dementia. And he develops a social constructionist perspective on the self. And he sees the self as divided into three aspects. First aspect is this, self a personal identity expressed via the use of personal pronouns such as me, myself, mine, our, which denotes mine and yours. In other words, as long as you can say I, you remain a self. You may not know who that I is, you may not be able to name what it was, but uh, uh, as long as you have consciousness in that sense, not that that's definitive of anything, uh, then the self exists and interconnects with the rest of the world. Self two is this, a person's physical and mental attributes and beliefs about those attributes, what you think, what you know, what you have, your bodily experiences, your height and weight, eye pigmentation, sense of humour, religious and political conviction, and so on and so forth. Beliefs about one's attributes such that, such that pride is taken in some and disdain is the reaction to others. So you know things about yourself. You're proud because you're a university lecturer, you're ashamed because you have certain thoughts, ideas, lusts, and so on and so forth. Uh, some may be more recent in their existence, being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, for example. So these are the, the inner attributes that you have. So you have self one, which is just your sense of I-ness. Self two is the things that you've done and the things you experience and the things that you have. Now self three is important. Self three is the various different social pers persona uh, which we construct in the variety of situations in which we live our life. Each persona involves a specific pattern of behaviour which is in many ways distinct from the others. One and the same person may display patterns of behaviour which are quite different from one another, such as a dedicated teacher, fun-loving friend, deferential child, romantic spouse, nurturing parent, and so on and so forth. But the third section here is the key. Each of these different social persona uh, requires for its existence the cooperation of at least one person, one other person in our social world. In other words, <clears throat> self one is just what you are, self two is what you've achieved, yourself in that sense, including that which you've biologically achieved, but self three requires some mode of community. So you can only be a teacher if people acknowledge you as a teacher, you can only be a pastor if people acknowledge you as a pastor, you can only be a father if people acknowledge you as a father. So self three requires community. And Sabat suggests that we need to keep in tension these three understandings of self when we're thinking about the experience of Alzheimer's. But it's self three that's tricky, as we'll see. On the first lecture that we had um, uh, in the conference, Elias, e e Elias, Elias, yeah, I like calling him Elias, I rename him Elias. Um, did a great lecture on, on uh, HIV and AIDS. 
And he talked about Ubuntu theology. Um, uh, and he talked about the idea, the idea behind Ubuntu theology is that unlike our kind of standard Cartesian ways in which we understand ourselves, um, in Ubuntu theology, uh, the suggestion is that we're always interconnected. Rather than I think, therefore I am, I am because we are. That we need one another to, to uh, become the people that we are. That's very similar to Sabat self three. So any dissolution of the self is a dissolution of community. Okay? So that's fundamentally important when you think about it, because most of the language that we use to describe the experience of people with Alzheimer's, we assume yourself is dissolving. But the perspective that's coming out here is that any dissolution of the self is the dissolution of community. Let me introduce uh, Peter to you. Peter's a very good friend of mine who uh, has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, he's had it for probably, I don't know, a year or 18 months, and he's just recently been taken into care as he, he moves into the next phase of his Alzheimer's experience. Peter's a highly um, qualified professional, or was a highly qualified professional. He was a head teacher. He was a man who's well respected within his community, who now, of course, has a very different role as he's a, an inmate in a care home. Uh, Peter's frustrated. He gets angry, he gets upset. Uh, the, the staff describe him as being arrogant, as demanding forms of relationships which he, they think are inappropriate. No, I don't mean inappropriate in a, a, a negative way, simply that he wants more respect than they're prepared to give to him, which is effectively what's being said. Um, and Peter's interesting. Before he went into uh, care, he, uh, his wife, Aileen, and my wife, and two of his, his very close friends, we were having a meal together. And my wife noticed that as they began to talk, uh, Peter became less and less part of what's going on. These were all close friends, people who he'd gone fishing with, people who he'd drunk whiskey with for many years and still continue to enjoy that. But as the conversation went on, so Peter began to disappear from the conversation. And people began to talk about him, talk about things, and he was no longer a part of that. And when you look at the literature on the experience of dementia, that's a very typical pattern. That the more the, the, the disease, disease uh, progresses, the less the person is enabled to participate in community. And that's not meant to be a criticism of, of his family or his friends. It's just a phenomenon. That the less engaged a person becomes, the less they are part of the community. And the, that causes in itself them to withdraw even more. Uh, and when you look at the literature on the friendships around people with um, uh, uh, particularly advanced uh, Alzheimer's, they all disappear. One by one, they just fall away, and eventually the person finds themselves isolated, and oftentimes in care, surrounded by strangers. Now think about the way in which self one and self two interact. What's that doing to his sense of identity? Quite apart from the neurological damage, what's that doing to his sense of identity and sense of place in the world? It seems that middle class uh, friendships are built to be pleasure crafts, rather than life rafts. There's something very important about the way that we construct our relationships. And we can talk about that perhaps later on. And so what you see, with, quite apart from, as I say, any neurological damage, what you see in the midst of uh, the experience of Alzheimer's is a falling away of your community, and eventually a movement more and more towards self one, but more and more towards alienation. Now, Aileen, uh, Peter's wife, um, has had some, uh, how can you put it, adventures with the social services and with the people that have been offering care. But these quotes she sent to me not so long ago. She said, Dear John, thought you might like these two quotes for your book on dementia. Now have a wee think about what's being said here. You should just divorce him. This is from a, a, an organisation in Aberdeen, Aberdeen called Alzheimer's Aberdeen. Now what does that mean? You should just divorce him. Why should you just divorce him? Presumably the person that said that assumed that Peter was losing his memory that his memory equates to himself, that his self was no longer there, that she had married somebody who's no longer there, so therefore divorce is, is, is a sensible way. Then she can get on with her life and change partners and do whatever she wants to do. That's a deeply profound statement about how this care worker perceives Peter. Another one said to her, Alzheimer's definitely time for a blue pill, blue pill being a, a pill for euthanasia. Now what's going on there? 
the same thing. Alzheimer's is worse than dying. Now, Peter's there, he's, he's walking around, he's not dead. But clearly this person that projects their understandings of what the uh, primary values in life would be, to have your memory, to have a sense of self, to be able to interact in the ways that you always have done, not to have these things is equitable with death, so therefore death seems to be an obvious um, reaction. Now these two things, may, two statements may be unpleasant and unfortunate, but they're not um, rare. Aileen says, all the people are very nice and easy to talk to, but surely there's something terribly wrong in all of this, and there is something terribly wrong in all of this. And it's not to do with these two people, it's something to do with the, the, the culture and the cultural expectations that we have decided uh, to adhere to. So think about Peter. Self one is fully intact. There's no problem, he knows who he is. He's forgotten a lot about who, who he's, where he's been, what he's doing. Fully intact. But self two is problematic. He's enduring roles of father, husband, teacher, friend, valuable person, spiritual person, someone worth spending time with, have all gone. He simply doesn't have these roles, at least not in the ways that he had before, in the sense of giving him identity. But instead he's got these new roles, Alzheimer's victim, a burden to society, of little worth, friendless, and obviously in the midst of that is intellectually lacking, which is not insignificant, and no longer spiritual because the care home that he uh, goes to doesn't take him to, to church in the way that he used to. That being so, self three is impossible. And so when he gets arrogant, when he gets, I'm putting that in inverted commas, when he gets arrogant, when he gets obstreperous, when he, he demands more than people think he should do, he's simply trying to express what he's always been. If you could imagine, I know somebody like, I don't know, Paul Griffiths, a, a highly qualified intellectual, who has dementia in a few years' time, and people take Paul into the, uh, their home and, and call him Paul and say, well, forget about all that st academic stuff. Now you're here. Sit down and read this kid's comic or sit down and watch this cartoon or do, do any of these things. And then people are surprised when Peter, in this case, gets annoyed, gets frustrated, gets angry. So self three is impossible, and it's impossible because his community has gone. And as I was lying in my bed this morning, contemplating, I know you probably don't want that vision, but, <laughs> but it was pleasant for me. I was reading Psalm 88, and I just, this, this, these, these, these verses just came out to me in relation to Peter. He said, I am forgotten, cut off from your care. You've thrown me into the lowest pit, into the darkest depths. Your anger weighs me down. With wave after wave, you have engulfed me. You have driven my friends away by making me repulsive to them. I'm in a trap. There's no way of escape. My eyes are blinded by my tears. Each day I beg for your help, O oh Lord. I lift my hands to you for mercy. Are, you wonderf are your wonderful deeds of any use to the dead? Do the dead rise up and praise you? Can those in the grave declare your unfailing love? Can they proclaim your faithlessness in the place of destruction? Faithfulness in the place of destruction. Can the darkness speak of your wonderful deeds? Can anyone in the land of forgetfulness talk about your righteousness? I want to come back to the Psalms of Lament towards the end because it's something about the way the Psalms function that captures human experience in a wonderful way. And this is just Peter. This is where he is. It's not where he has to be, but it's where we've chosen to place him. So culturally, it's very difficult to see why we might choose to offer Peter dignity. Now, I'm not going to get into any kind of conceptual conversations about what dignity might be. People have done that much better than I could over the past few days. Um, so, if I can have a working definition of different dignities, roughly being the quality of, of being deemed worth of esteem, worthy of esteem or respect. Why would we give, culturally, why would we give Peter such dignity? Stephen Post talks about the idea of hypercognition. He says that within Western culture, we're so focused on the intellect or the essence of what it means to be human that we've become, he calls it, hypercognitive that we focus on that as the primary way of understanding meaningfulness of life. Within that context, Peter doesn't have hypercognition or any kind of cognition, really, or at least he's moving towards a serious lack of cognition. Natural assumptions about individualism and the capacities necessary for personhood. If it comes to capacities for personhood, he's losing them all. He's becoming more and more dependent. He's losing his rationality. He's losing his sense of history. Everything that Peter Singer says is a person and John Locke is going. So why on earth would we respect him? Why on earth would we give him dignity? Because intellects, the way we 
things we value. The first thing, the first thing you guys probably do when you meet somebody new, excuse my finger, is to say, what do you do? And they'll tell you, and then you'll place them in a kind of hierarchy from university professor down to university professor, depending on what you are. <laughs> Possibly, and then you'll respond, and you'll take them seriously or not. Intellect's the way that we value people. And if you start to lose that, and if, particularly if you tie that in with humanness, you've got a real problem. The close connection between a personhood and, and memory, the fact that you have to remember who you are to be a person, and finally, the close connection of intellect with the soul. The idea that somehow what we know is more than just knowledge. It's something deep down within our soul that, it, that it's revealed in our intellect. Our soulishness is revealed in our intellect. I want to challenge all of these points as we move on. And I want to suggest that there's a better way, particularly for Christians, to begin to think, or perhaps only for Christians, to think about that, to think about things. We can offer Peter dignity, and we have to offer Peter dignity, and I'll show you why. I want to begin with the doctrine of creation. Um, I want to kind of work a little bit with the, the tension between creation and resurrection, because I think if we think about creation and resurrection, we might be able to work out a way of understanding Peter's situation, as an aka anybody's situation, and from there begin to uh, work through how we might respond. One of the things I think we oftentimes forget is that we are creatures. The doctrine of creation is very clear that we are created by God, not because of anything that we, we uh, have done or could do or could ever do, um, but simply because God, in his loving desire, wants to do that. That being so, everything that we have is gift. Okay? So the problem, one of the problems perhaps with a, a capacities view of, of person, for example, is you assume that you have capacities rather than that you're given capacities. If we shift that around and begin to think of it in terms of gift, that's important. Secondly, that means that um, everything that we have is contingent, i.e. dependent on God. There's nothing that you or I could do apart from that which God has enabled us to do or even allows us to do. So the whole of our lives are contingent. We're not our own self-rulers, as autonomy and sovereignty might suggest. We are, in fact, contingent beings with limited freedom, freedom that's given to us according to God, according to particular purposes. And I want, even at this stage, to think about particular purposes, that perhaps time is meaningful. And perhaps anything that's gifted to us is not gifted to us to help us to be better people in that sense, but it's to help us to be better disciples who participate more faithfully. And there's a difference, as we'll see. Contingency, nothing exists apart from God's desire for it to exist. So we're sustained but not immortal. Now, the way I want you to think about this is, if you think about the Genesis account of creation, we've talked a lot this week about um, the image of God. And let me give you one possible way in which we could think about that. Um, if you look at the Genesis account um, of creation, the second Genesis account, what happens? God creates the world. God creates... Uh, uh, animals and plants, and breathes God's nephesh, God's spirit, into the whole of creation. And so in that sense, soulishness, spirit, has to do with that which God gives to any creature in order for it to be something, to be alive. Uh, to be alive is to have God's spirit, to be remembered by God, to have God's spirit. To be dead is not to have that. So at that creaturely level, we're exactly the same as all the different creatures that there are in the world, which is why we're so similar to them, perhaps, I presume. So God breathes his nephesh, his spirit, into the whole of, of creation. But as you go and read and think about that account, the only creature that God chooses to uh, enter into relationship with is Adam. All the other creatures are there. All the other creatures are inspired by God in that sense, but it's only Adam that God chooses to enter into relationship with. And one way in which we could understand the image of God, and one way perhaps amongst other ways, is that it has to do with God's desire to relate with human beings. In other words, the image of God is ecstatic. It's something that comes from outside. It's not to do with the capacities that you have. It's not to do even with your ability to respond. It's not as if, if you know, if Adam had said, yeah, well, I don't want to speak to you, God, and that would be the end of the conversation. It's nothing to do with that. It's everything to do with God's desire to reach into uh, history and to uh, engage in some mode of relationship with his creatures. And perhaps that's where human relationality in its 
most positive forms, images or reflects God's glory in that particular way. So we're sustained but not immortal. We're soulish in the sense that the whole of our being is our soul. Our soul is not something that, a small part here that goes on forever and ever in that way. We, the whole of us turns towards God. The whole of us finds salvation in that sense and the whole of us finds life. So in that sense, we have a, a dual nature. Um, freedom, limited freedom at that level to do certain things and to be able to participate with God in certain ways in the way that history is unfolding. But at the same time, always under divine sustenance. So any gifts that you have, any capacities that you have, only make sense and can only function as they're sustained by something beyond yourself. And so in other words, we're fundamentally dependent. Now, in relation to uh, the, the challenges of, of dementia, that's really, really important. Dementia may simply be an extension, a more obvious and more focused form of the way that everybody already is. The problem is we don't notice it. Yeah. Maybe our task is to begin a ministry of noticing. So the self, in that sense, comes from God and returns to God. In other words, as people were divinely held, our self is not something that we establish, it's something that we, get, we receive and something that's held by God. Now, if that's right, then the question is, does dementia actually destroy personhood or selfhood? And the answer would be, no, it doesn't. Because part of the, the again, going back to the Genesis, again, part of the, the tragedy, if you like, of, of being human is that we get old, we wither, we get ill. Things happen to us, not just to us for, because we're singled out uh, as particularly sinful creatures. That's just part of being a person is to decline. Now, the complicated reasons for that are, are, are complicated. But to decline is to be human. And that's important because we're creatures for whom decay is inevitable. Personhood is not diminished by dementia or any other condition. Such conditions are part of what it means to be persons. In other words, dementia is part of what it means to be a person. You may not like it, it might be unpleasant, but it's no different from anybody else in that sense. You don't lose your personhood in that way. We do not move from being persons to being non-persons. Change and decay in all of its forms is part of what it means to be a person. And I think that's a really important uh, uh, counter or counter opinion to some of the ways in which personhood works itself out. Somehow that, the capacities way it works out that you can be a person one day and you cannot be a person one, the next day. You can walk out here and fall down the stairs and at the top of the stairs you'll be a person but the time you get to the bottom of the stairs you'll be a non-person and we can all kill you. You can fall asleep and become a non-person, so on and so forth. But this way of thinking about things, it's impossible to lose your personhood because your personhood doesn't belong to you. Your personhood is sustained by God for God's purposes. Um, and this is more of a discussion point for later, I think. The question that obviously emerges from that kind of theological interpretation is, does that translate? Now, if you're a nurse or a chaplain or if you're somebody working in a more secular context, does that make sense in terms of, of giving people dignity and giving people, um, enabling uh, people to, to or working out bioethical arguments in relation to personhood? And the answer is that I think the issue of translation is a secondary thing. I think the first question is, is it right? Is it faithful? And the second question is, does it translate? Now, we can talk about that. Um, I think one of the problems that we oftentimes have is we begin with the translation question and then try to work our theology into that. And I'm suggesting that perhaps we need to work our theology first and then look at how that translates, if translation is the right way of putting it. In other words, we need to move beyond dilemmas. So following on from that, assuming that we are uh, contingent, let's think about what that might mean for sustaining the selfhood uh, re 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 reframed in that sense of people with severe Alzheimer's. A friend of mine, um, Margaret Hutchison, who is a nurse in Adelaide, it sent me this story a few years ago, and it's, it's a story that's worth retelling. She talks about um, a woman who she worked with, with who had severe dementia, and who was normally a very placid and very pleasant person, who suddenly became agitated and angry and upset. And she began to walk up and down the wards, the, the halls of the ward, corridors of the ward, 
repeating the same word over and over and over again. Now, the team got together, and they began to work out what the strategy was. Clearly, her behaviour had changed. Now, it could be that she's moved to some new neurological stage in her illness, so therefore these things are caused by that. Uh, so does she need medication? Does she need restraint? So on and so forth. But one nurse got alongside her, and she was a Christian, incidentally, or maybe not incidentally, and began to walk up and down the, the corridor with her. Uh, and she began to listen to what she was saying. And, and what this woman was saying was over and over and over again the same word, which was God. God, 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 God. And suddenly the nurse kind of locked into what she was thinking about. And she said to her, are you afraid that God will forget you? Are you or are you afraid that God, you'll forget God? Uh, and she stopped dead uh, and she looked the nurse in the eye and she said, yes. She'd been a Christian all her life and she was afraid that she was forgetting God. She was afraid that she was losing her salvation in that sense. And the nurse said to her, you will forget God, but God will never forget you. And her behaviour calmed down and she became more or less similar to the way that she had been before. Something, it was something that had been on her mind at that moment. But I think there's a key there, and it's not a simple key, but it's an important key, that the task, our task as human beings is not simply to remember God, but to recognise that we're remembered by God. And perhaps it's that being remembered by God is, is, is a more important dy dynamic. This little passage from Luke will get us into the, the zone, as they say. Jesus talking to the, um, the criminal on the cross. Says, uh, the criminal cross says, Jesus, remember me when you begin ruling as king. Then Jesus said to him, listen, what I say is true. Today you'll be with me in paradise. <clears throat> There's something in that passage about Jesus, remember me, that is, I think is very, very important. Uh, and digs into some of the fundamental fears that people have, both in terms of for other people and for themselves, that you'll be forgotten by God, that you'll lose your salvation, that somehow uh, you uh, will lose... Well, we'll come back to, to what I mean by that. But in order to understand that, I want us to think about what it might mean to be remembered by God. The question that I asked you at the beginning was, what do you actually know about yourselves? And I want us just to tease that out a little bit. When you look at the, the, the studies on the way that memory fun functions, there's a really interesting book by Daniel Schachter, if that's the right way to pronounce it, um, on memory. And it's called Searching for Memory. And it's really just a, an analysis of what memory is, how it functions, and how and why we remember the way that we do. And one of the things that he notices is that, uh, is that memory is always constructive, that we don't remember things just as they are. We remember things... Uh, in ways in relation to what we know today. So when you're thinking about your childhood and remembering your childhood, you're not actually remembering it purely. You're remembering it in light of everything that's happened since your childhood. And so most of our memories are constructed in that. It's not to say they're all false, but it's certainly to say that they are constructed and influenced and changed by the way that we put them together. Uh, and he also has a, a, a wonderful little chapter in there on false memories, looking at the way in which you can inject memories into people's lives without them even knowing it. And you can really believe things that have happened in your life that never happened at all. Uh, he's talking in that case about therapy, but you can do it in a variety of different contexts. In other words, your memory is more than a little bit uncertain. Um, and also, you tend to remember what you, you, you want to remember about your life. There's huge swathes of your life that you've forgotten. And often, particularly for your younger life, because most of what you know about your longer, younger life, you've probably got from your mother or your father or your brothers, which you've then processed into your own memory, and then it becomes your own memory, and so on and so forth. So although you've got a picture of the way that your life is, actually, it's not as certain and not as clear as you think it is. There are huge parts of your life that you've forgotten, huge parts of your life that have moved on, and huge parts of your life that you, you misinterpret. And I was, as I was reading that book, I, I came across this passage in Jeremiah that I thought was quite interesting. Jeremiah says, But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds preserve, deserve. And when I thought, read that, it seems to me what Jeremiah is saying, amongst other things, obviously, is that the only person that really knows who you are is God. 
The only person that remembers you in all of your fullness is God. You may be really certain about the way that your life is, but actually things might be quite, quite different. You know, if, you, if you read, for example, Augustine's Confessions, he completely rereads his life in the light of uh, his experience with Christ and in the light of his, his conversion. Everything that he thought he knew about his life actually looked very, very different when he, when he knew who God was. I suspect that's what uh, Judgment Day will be like for most of us. And so the suggestion that people with dementia are qualitatively different in the sense that they've forgotten who they are and don't know who they are um, is simply, well, it's questionable to put it mildly. The only person that really holds our story well is the God who enters into relationship with us. Uh, I was going to tell you this, uh, a little uh, illustration from Denzel Washington. Do you think I look a bit like... No, you know. <laughs> I suppose you think that was a joke. Yeah. Anyway, he, Denzel's black, so it's all right. The... Uh, <laughs> but I won't because I, I realised that if I was going to have to tell you this story I'd have to tell you the plot line and if you wanted to see it you'd probably get annoyed with me have anybody seen it? Oh, not, not enough of you I'd probably be sued by the film company but if anybody wants to know the illustration of the book of your life come and speak to me later on that's right so with that in mind think about memory, soul and resurrection what I've suggested to you is that uh, a person is not de-souled by dementia because your soul is there inspired by God and held by God irrespective of what you are. The question then is about memory and resurrection. And within that, I, I think I, I, we need to think about uh, what it means to be remembered well by God. And this is what I think. Let me read this to you. Soul theologically names the me that God sees and remembers. This is a direct bearing not only on my endurance after my death and my identity when I have dementia, but on my every moment. God always knows who we are, and we're always only partially understanding who we are. On such a view, dementia is just another stage in a totally dynamic process of the God-human relationship in which God is leading us into our true selves, and we're always only grasping this in bits and pieces. I'm working at this level with a very common sense observation that you may well have a better view of me, all of you, having watched me objectively over a few years, none of you, uh, than I have of myself. Who I think I am is literally made up of, of who people have reflected back to me that I am. And the determinative voice is God's. I am therefore never really convinced that there's a, vo there's a more real me elsewhere. I really am here as I am. But I don't know who I am because I'm a human. I have limited powers of perception and my perception is shaped by my interests. See what I'm saying? I think I know myself, but I don't actually know myself. I actually know what I know about myself. What I know about myself may be completely wrong, but God knows exactly who I am. If soul equals endurance, only God can ensure that not, in that, not any quality of my being. If soul equals my personality, I can only trust that there's any continuity between the person I was 20 years ago and the guy that I am now. Because my whole body, with the exception of my brain, has rejuvenated over the past 20 years. So this body I have is not the same one. So I can only be hopeful that there's something of me that's uh, endured over the years. I certainly can't observe or prove that. Might I be gone one day if I get Alzheimer's? No, because what people experience as my personality is a fleeting phenomenon dependent on all kinds of biological substrates. Am I still me when I lose my personality? Only if God is faithful to, to, to see my living human body as continuous with the life he has given me in all of its rich particularity. And I trust that God is true to his children and creatures in this way. So it seems to me that helps me to understand that I'm a confused eye at the best of times and that I have to be dependent on God to, to hold my identity now. But it also helps me with the resurrection because it seems to me one way in which we could understand the resurrection or aspects of the resurrection is that it's in the memory of God that we're held and it's in the memory of God that we're resurrected. The Apostle Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, 15 says that uh, the resurrection bodies will have similarity and dissimilarity. In other words, there's something of what we have just now that we'll retain and, and continue, but there's something radically different that will go on after our, our lives in the resurrection body. And it seems to me recognising that no matter where we've been, no matter what we've forgotten, and you've all forgotten, we've all forgotten, God holds us as we are 
um, in his memory. And in that memory and through that memory, the resurrection becomes a possibility. And it's at that point that we'll discover who our true selves are. At the moment, we're on a journey. We're struggling with searching for who we are. But at that point, we'll know who we are. So with all of that as background, I want us just to, to move into, begin to think about what that means in terms of, of practice. I watched, uh, I don't know if you guys ever listened to uh, iTunes U, iTunes University. Yeah, if you do, you're probably as sad as I am. But I listen to it in my bed at night, it helps me to go to sleep. But I can't sleep because I start thinking about it, it's terrible. Actually, I'm an insomniac. So if any of you guys have got any help for sleeping problems, I would appreciate that. But that's uh, for another counselling session. And I was listening to John Golding Day, who's a, a, a he's a... Um, Old Testament scholar at Fuller University. Um, and he has, his wife, who sadly has now died, had a, a, a severe degenerative illness. And at the time of this recording, um, she was obviously moving towards uh, the end stages of, of her, her experience. And she, uh, he said, I'm going to invite you all over for pancakes on Tuesday. Um, as many as, you, as, as possible can come over. Um, and I'd like you to meet my wife. Now, she's in a wheelchair. She won't know you're there. But I'd like you to go and speak to her. Um, now, for the most part, she won't know you're there, he said. But for that moment, she'll appreciate it. And I just suddenly thought to myself, that's it. It's the sacrament of the present moment. It's that place of meeting, that place where we who image God and God's desire to reach out to us, reach out to one another in love and encounter it's that space that's a key, perhaps, or a key for how we can understand dignified dementia care. To be a person to be remembered well, I'll come back to that. And I began to think about that. What, is, what does a spirituality of time look like? You know, time's a strange commodity, and particularly you know, in, our, in our culture and in our pastoral ministry, it's a strange commodity. I'm always fascinated by the way that our understanding of time is linked to our economic system. We spend time, we buy time, we waste time, we lose time. You know, everything that you do with your money, you do with your time. You know? And oftentimes we prioritise our time according to the economics of the moment or the economics of a particular context we're in. But I was think, began to think, you know, the sacrament of the present moment, which of course is, is, is deeply embedded in the, in the Christian tradition, what does spirituality of time might look like? Then I began to think, you know, People think that they live in time where they can waste it. But actually, if we believe in cross and resurrection, if we believe in the kingdom of God as Jesus lays it out, then we live in eschatological time. In other words, we live in a time which is quite different from the way that people normally perceive time. And that, uh, an eschatological time is filled with fresh and different meaning. In terms of funny thing, I read an article about uh, Albert Einstein's theory of time. I don't know if you've ever come across it. He, he reckons that uh, he talks about real time and he talks about imaginary time. Imaginary time is where we, we think we are, where we're always moving forward towards the next goal. But he says that time's actually flattish. All time occurs at the same time. And, and he, says this is, he says this is comfort to those who have lost somebody, that actually the pe person that you've lost hasn't gone at all, but just still exists in another period of flat time, or not flat time, or time as time. Uh, and John Paul can come put it nicely. That's not very comforting. Try speaking to them. And it's kind of true. But, but there's something interesting about that, that we tend to think that we're moving forward in time, uh, whereas, in fact, actually, we may not be moving forward in that sense. We may be just simply experiencing time differently as we move towards the eschaton, even if towards is the right way of putting it. But the key thing about eschatological time is every moment matters. Every second, everything that you do, everything that you think, every decision you make has divine significance. It's not just mistakes that we make, it's, or it's not just experiences that we have. Every moment has significance. And that takes us, some, to some extent, to the heart of the contemplative tradition. I've been reading a lot of stuff on the contemplative tradition, and it's very interesting, because these guys uh, and women, uh, to put it simply, try desperately to get away from their intellect. And so they'll go out into the desert and stand in poles and wear uh, hair shirts uh, to get away from their, their thoughts and their thinking and their reasoning. 
in order to get to that place of contemplation, that place where all that matters is loving God. Uh, <clears throat> to everything else doesn't matter. It, all that matters is that you've focused on, you're concentrated uh, and experienced and, 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 and emerging into this, this great love of God. Which is kind of the opposite of the way, well, I'm a Presbyterian. It's kind of the opposite of the way we understand contact with God. First of all, you've got to know things, and then you, 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 you develop a relationship. It's almost like you just have to stop knowing certain things and emerge into that. But within the contemplative tradition, you begin to learn how to love God for God's sake. Not because it's what you want from God, not because of anything that you're liable to get in the future or anything you, that you have in the present. You love God simply for God's sake. Why do you love God simply for God's sake? Because that's precisely how God loves you. And so the contemplative tradition gives us an attitude and approach which enables us, irrespective of what your cognitive state is, to be with you. To enter into the significance of the present moment, even if that present moment is only fleeting, even if I'm with you for a millisecond, that millisecond is fundamentally important. Even if I touch you and reach into your soul, so to speak, for a split second, that moment is precious. And there's something really important about rethinking and reconfiguring our time. Why do we love the person with dementia when they seem to have gone? Because that's how God loves us. Not for anything that we have, could have, have ever had, but because that's where we are. And it seems to me that's what the Christian community is designed to reveal and to embody a sense of love, simply for love's sake. Faith in Jesus requires to be embodied, not just in minded. There's a little passage in Jeremiah 22, 16, where uh, Jeremiah is talking about King Josiah. Uh, and he talks about him being a good king. Why is he a good king? He's a good king because he does justice to the poor and because he looks after the weak and needy. And then <clears throat> Jeremiah says, or Jeremiah says that God says, is that not what it means to know me? Isn't that interesting? It's not to know you. To go do justice to the poor, to be with the weak and the needy, is to know God. In other words, knowing God is a social practice. You know, I, I work with people, alongside people who know a lot about God, but I have no idea whether anybody knows God. You know what I'm saying? There's something about, you can know it, whatever you want about God. To know God is to do justice. To know God is to encounter the world in a particular way. To know God is to, to in a sense, behave in the ways that God behaves. So beginning to think about the significance of the present moment, beginning to think about embodying the new kingdom and embodying the knowledge of God within you is fundamentally important because when I've forgotten who God is, which I will do if I, if I, if I had dementia, no matter how strong a Christian I have been, how am I going to know God? And the way I'm going to know God is through you. And that knowledge will be not secondary knowledge, it's actually fundamentally revelation. Okay, as I move towards the end, let me just, because uh, there's lots of things I'd like to talk about, and I'm sure you've got lots of things to, to complain about. Did you just laugh? It's a uh, <laughs> <laughs> A very odd cough. It takes sense. All oh, right, well, it was worse. I, I, I thought you were dying or something. Like <laughs> so, what I'm suggesting to you is that knowledge of God may be, may be relational. That, that's not to say that intellectual knowledge is, is not important, but I'm suggesting that in this context we're allowed to see something different. Um, but I also want to suggest that spirituality, in particular worship, is always communal. The, we're in, in the process of finishing off a project looking at the spiritual lives of people with profound and complex intellectual disabilities. People who... Uh, can't understand words and don't use language as their first mode of communication. And the question, a question, one of the questions is, how can we communicate the gospel to people in that, that kind of situation? As a good Presbyterian, as you, um, you'll know, uh, words are everything. And so it's a really good challenge to begin to think about other ways in which we might communicate. But this, is, this, is, this young lady here is Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth has a profound intellectual disability. Um, she's blind, she has, has some hearing, and uh, she has no communication skills whatsoever. So she, spends most of, she also has cerebral palsy, she spends most of her day lying on the ground. And she can communicate in, in tactile ways with those who know and understand their mode of communication, but for the most part it's very difficult for her. Now on top of that, Elizabeth was diagnosed not so long ago with leukaemia. Uh, and she went into hospital to have a treatment, and her mother... Uh, 
Well, she went into the hospital to, to, to have her tests. Uh, her mother got to receive the, the results of the tests, and she um, went into Elizabeth's room to tell her. And she said, Elizabeth, you have leukemia. Uh, and Elizabeth burst into tears. Now, what was going on there? Because clearly, conceptually, she couldn't understand what the word leukemia meant. I don't think. Maybe she could. But I think there's something else going on. So, first story. Second story is uh, Elizabeth's a Quaker, and she's very much a part of the Quaker community. Uh, and Quakers have no problem in accepting uh, her into her community because the intellect, uh, intellectual acknowledgement of particular theological presuppositions, prepositions, is not the way in which they function theologically. So she was uh, uh, taken into that community early on. And what they were saying to me as we gathered together with the community was that uh, Elizabeth can be quite noisy at times and she gets agitated. But as soon as she, uh, the community go into silence, which of course is central to the Quaker way of worship, she changes. And they said, watch this. And so the community went into the silence. And Elizabeth was agitated and, and a little bit upset. But as soon as the community went into their, their silence, as soon as the, the spirit of silence began to emerge, she settled down, she quietened down, and she became one with them. And as soon as the, the, the silence was broken, she became back to, to where she was before. Now, what's going on in these two stories is, is what fascinates me. It seems to me that she probably doesn't know what leukemia means, but she does, our mother does know what leukemia means. And her mother was upset and anxious, and clearly that transmitted to her. So she experienced, she didn't understand the concept, but she experienced the emotions through her mother. What was going on in that context of worship was something very similar. She didn't understand the words of, of, of the tradition. She didn't understand what was going on, but she sensed and experienced the emotions, the silence, the feelings of being in community uh, that, as, the, as the community went into silence. In other words, for Elizabeth, her spirituality and her worship are communal. Now, we tend to think that our spirituality is something we have to ourselves, we need to work out. But within her life, she needs everybody around her in order that she can worship, in order that she can be at one with her experience of God and her experience with her community. And I think there's something really important with that, because I suspect that's the same for all of us. We think we have personal spirituality. We think we choose to go to, to church or we choose this that, or that and the next thing. You know, personal choice is, is ingrained in our culture. But I think the reality is that our spirituality is always communal. And there's something really fascinating about that. You know, Wheeler, Wheeler Robinson's idea of the corporate personality in, in, of Israel, the idea that there's no individual, that actually the people of Israel were always perceived themselves as a, a community and an ionist within that. And I suspect that's something that we've lost from our own worship. Um, but taking Elizabeth's experience and putting that into the context of advanced uh, dementia, you can see where the connection is. The person may no longer be able to understand. They may no longer be able to know what's going on. They may no longer be able to sing or express the words that they did before. But by being in community, whatever size that community is, they can worship. They can be drawn into the worship as the community worship. Even if that community is just a community of two. So I think when we begin to think in that way, you can see there's some flaws in the way that we work through our theology. There's some flaws in the way that we work through our worship. And there's flaws in the way that we work through our liturgy that are thrown up and thrown into sharp light by the experiences of people with this kind of um, disability. And it may well be Horrible as Alzheimer's is, and, I, and my point is not that it's a good thing, because that's not, but it may well be that actually it's our communities that are disabled rather than the individual, or the indiv their communities are as disabled as the individual. It may be that our relationships and the way that we work things out are the f where we need to focus, rather than having arguments about whether or not the person before you is in fact the person before you. Maybe that we're looking at the wrong place when we think about our ethical dilemmas. So we could go on, but I, I want to leave some time to, to talk about. But it's one of the things, if I was going to talk more, I would want to talk about the significance of lament. Because it seems to me that there's a tension in the experience of uh, dementia, dementia care between experiencing the person in the presence of the moment and sometimes finding joy as they recover some experiences that they had before and the reality of lament. Uh, 
whereby everything's being taken from me. God seems to be abandoning me. God seems to be taking them away from me, the very things that make me who I am. And it's working between that tension and joy and lament, without lament overtaking joy, and without joy making lament unrealistic. That is fundamental to good Christian um, dementia care. Tied in with that is the idea of companioning, beginning to think about what friendship means for those who have been defriended. Knowing God is a practice, beginning to see that, yes, it's important that we know things, but it's also important that we embody these things in order that those who can't understand what we know can experience that in different ways. Pray in the kingdom. And practicing doubt. And what I mean by that, and this is the last thing I want to say to you, is that we need to learn to give people the benefit of the doubt. We need to learn not to be taken in by cultural assumptions, even medical assumptions, that the person's not there, that somehow the loss is so significant that we can think about things like euthanasia or we can think about things like uh, throwing people into to homes with strangers. Uh, not that I'm saying that that's a bad thing. That was a bad way of putting it because sometimes that, that's the right thing to do. But I think you understand the, the dynamic I'm, I, I'm trying to figure out. We need to learn to give people the benefit of the doubt that when you come before that person, we were on. And it's up to you to capture that, and me to capture that. <clears throat> and it's up to us to practice friendship and companioning along that place of knowing where there is no knowing. And so just to absolutely finish, dignity is a face. And I think that's very important that, that we remember that. In the midst of all our conceptual arguments and all of the, con- the important conversations that we've had over the past few days, the, uh, behind that, there are faces there are people, there are bodies. Uh, and we need to have knowledge in order to practice well, but we need to practice well. So your task for today is to pray for Peter. Thank you. Mm, that's a fair point. Yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's, a good, that's a good point. And there is a tension there between not knowing yourself completely and therefore becoming morally irrespo- uh, no longer morally responsible, and yet recognising that there's a contingency about your knowledge that, that, re- that requires to, um, um, uh, you to act in particular ways. So I think that uh, I agree with that. I think I don't, want to, I don't want to resolve that tension because I think that is where the tension actually is. Because the danger is, I suppose, you drift into uh, lethargy or universalism or, or, or something like that. Um, having said that, um, although I, st- I think that God, I'd be emphasizing that God remembers, I guess that you also have to hold that intention with the rather darker fact that you see it particularly in the, in the Old Testament God forgets. And uh, when God forgets you, then you have. Problems. Yeah. Can I ask one quick follow-up to that? Of course. Do you think that in the resurrection, this is speculative, yeah. uh, we will right, obviously rightly and fully remember who we are now in any sense? I, I think we do. Well, I think we will. And I think, you know, Paul's conversation in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15 does indicate that there's continuity and discontinuity. And likewise, you can see that in the resurrected body of Jesus, that there's continuity and discontinuity. Jesus continues to have his scars, which, the meaning of which is transformed, but the, the, the history of which remains the same.
So I, I think uh, it is speculative, but it seems, I think there's good evidence to suggest that we don't become somebody completely different. In other words, this, this world matters. Context, one of the questions that often comes up um, is this notion of when people get to the advanced stages of dementia and you know they lose the ability to be able to, to swallow you know, yeah. and whatnot. And, and for a number of years before you had certain kinds of technology, um, often the result of this, I mean, at a certain level, that the person would either you know dehydrate or something along that yeah. line, kind of. Uh, the disease would, uh, or the, the experience would run its course, so to speak. Yeah. And a big question that often comes up ethically in that context is, um, is it appropriate to, to give artificial feeding nutrition hydration with respect to advanced you know, stages yeah. of, of um, dementia and Alzheimer's or whatnot? And in light of your presentation in terms of this idea of the sacrament of the moment and, uh, and, and the different distinctions of the self, would you have any either guidance or thoughts as to the uh, what would be the appropriate course of action in a, in a situation like that. And perhaps I'm not describing it. it yeah. At least for some, there's a very difficult tension there, especially in a hospice context when you're not trying yeah. to do a lot of preventive treatment, but you're still trying to provide comfort care. But that, that kind of dynamic... Um, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, the, yeah. Um, I, I suppose one of the problems with medical technology is it can keep you alive for, forever. And that, so it, and that raises, I mean, it raises issues that, that are very new in, in that sense. Um, and it also raises issues about what death is. Cause, I mean, I think death has a very particular meaning within our culture, doesn't it? Because, well, maybe less so, maybe less so in, the, in the US than the UK. If you think about the UK, which is much more secularised than you, you get the movement from the Enlightenment onwards, which rejects the gospel story in, in, in some, one way or another. And so people relocate the, the narratives in science and technology, and then you have the, t the, the Holocaust, and you have cancer, and you have HIV and AIDS, which not, I'm not finding cures for. So people lose the confidence in that. Um, you have no sense of the afterlife, so therefore you lose confidence in that. So all you have is what you have. So you think you're kind of trapped in the eternal present, uh, which is why healthcare, it seems to me, is so... Uh, uh, high in people's agenda because if all you have is, is what you have then you've got to look after it really well and within, <coughs> within that context death, death has a particular meaning i.e. no matter whether it's advanced dementia or whatever it is uh, it's a failure or it can be perceived as a failure or it's certainly something that you don't want to move into and you don't want your, your, your family to move into no matter what the circumstances are because you've got to kind of hold it in there so I suppose in answer to your question um, uh, Alzheimer's is a terminal illness. Uh, the key thing would not be the elongation of life, but the quality of life. It would be how you were with that person uh, uh, as they head towards or move towards their death that would be the key, not the, the ability or inability to, to sustain that. So at a certain stage, a certain point, a uh, decision would have to be made that that life has come to, this, this, uh, that forms of intervention would be inappropriate for quality of life, obviously. But then at that, case, that, that, that point is where good Christian palliative care, uh, or any kind of palliative care, but in particular the kind of Christian care I'm talking about, clicks in because it's not a matter of, okay, then we we'll switch off this or we pull this out. It's how you actually enable that person and the social structure or the family to move into that next phase. That's, that's where the real challenge is. So though, though there's a dilemma there about will I feed, will I not, will I uh, hydrate or not, Actually, the, the, the key thing is not elongation, but quality, I think. Just a, a, a question about the notion of um, worship, knowing God, is the social practice, the community practice. Um, part of the puzzle for me is, is exactly, well, exactly is a little too strong, because it's going to be ambiguous anyway, but um, are there signs, are there um, propensities or properties that one can identify to say that this is this is a practice of knowing God, a community practice. Of that. How does one know? How does a community know that? In the example you gave of someone who's in a crisis, where she is able to sort of respond to the community at yeah. an emotional level. But let's suppose that that's not there. What what are the signs? 
to enable a community to, to know when when the, this communal practice is not is not there for that for that individual. Yeah, I'm not expressing this well. Yeah. You understand it's sort of what I'm shooting for. Well. As, as what you're saying, I mean, in that context, the particular practice fitted in quite well with the experience of Elizabeth. So therefore, there was natural, it, was, it was kind of a natural movement for the community to do that. Um, and I suppose as part of your question would be, um, what if there's no obvious or natural way? So if you're a very word-oriented church, or if you're, you're a, a liturgy that is focused on, uh, on cognitive and intellect, how would you know to, to move beyond that to something different? Well, the answer is that certain congregations would be able to do it and certain wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do it. In terms of formal structure and liturgy, it, it, it probably wouldn't work. Um, but there's no reason why, for example, if you wanted to take this kind of ministry seriously, you couldn't form groups, which were, uh, I don't mean form groups of people with Alzheimer's, but form worship groups which met together uh, at particular moments in time and, it, and enabled and worked towards finding ways to help this person to, to participate. So although you may not have, it may not be possible to do that at a formal Sunday meeting, for example, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't uh, do it on another occasion which is more geared towards enabling them. But, the, that, but that, that, that's one way you could do it. But the problem with that, would be, that, with that is that the challenge would be gone from the community. And so the, the community would still assume that that what it was doing is the only way to do it. And you have, a, if you like, a pastoral care group. Whereas what I, I think I want you to think about is possibly that this is a missing, missing dimension. Yeah, it still may have to be done in a, a different context, a different place. But that what happens in that different context has to feed into what happens within the wider church. So it can't be just, this is a nice place for, for people that are interested in such things. Because some of the gifts that, that are being brought there, or rev, uh, revelation, I don't mean revelation with a small uh, R, that are being brought to, to light through ministering to people, we all need to hear. Because there's nothing qualitatively different about dimension. That's the key thing I want to think about. I, know, I mean, I don't think that's a question, but that certainly would be a possible way of, of, of dealing with that. Yeah. Well, well, when you were talking, like, you're, it was so good. Like, everything you said was like, there's so much truth. Um, my grandfather died of dementia actually last year. Oh, really? Week. Yeah, and he, like, lived with us, so I, I saw it. Right. Too. But um, the verse that I was thinking of as you were talking was the verse that says, like, right now we see in a mirror dimly, yeah. um, but then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. Yeah. And that just seems like to be, like, right on with what you're saying. Yeah, like, that's, that's, that, that's like, very helpful, actually. This, like, your soul is retained through God's knowledge of you. Yeah. Um, I guess I just want to hear That's very good. No, no, I think that's, I, because that, that allows you to, to it kind of, in a sense, addresses your point, because if you're seeing yourself in a mirror uh, darkly, you're seeing yourself. So, like, it's, it's not like nothing's happening. Um, but it's, the, there's something about the, the, uh, the darkness or something about the lack of clarity that's important and, and gives you that kind of eschatological pointer in that way. So I wouldn't want the idea into that. I think that's, that actually is very, very helpful. Yeah. I was going to ask you to comment through your experiences, uh, some of the giftedness you've no doubt seen. Uh, we're looking at it one way, of us interacting with older parents or grandparents, yeah. as you mentioned, but what about the giftedness that certainly is coming back yeah. from, from, from them through or God through, through them? Well, I think that, that well, there's two things I would say. One, there are certain circumstances where there's no giftedness, where it's, it's just toil and difficult. Um, and so there's no, I mean, I, I want not to try and idealise dementia. I mean, I want to hold in tension the possibility that we need to look harder and look differently with the reality that it's a very difficult illness to cope with as a person and to cope with as a family. So I, I don't want to idealise it. Um, but I think that um, it is possible to, to learn from, 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 from your experience with, with people. And I think the kind of thing you, you would learn is, well, the kind of thing a congregation would learn is how word-oriented it is and how exclusive it is with, in, with regards to the way at which it practices uh, and therefore it's challenged to, to be more, not inclusive in a kind of politically correct way, but to begin to see that there may be more to its understanding of gospel, worship and liturgy than it that it has previously understood. For families, I guess it depends on how you frame it. 
there is a sense of what you I mean. Gilbert, Gilbert Melander last night says, what did he say? Oh, yesterday he said he wrote a paper saying, Why I want to be a burden on my parents. Uh, and I like that. I'm going, to, I'm going to write that paper for my kids. Um, but there's something about, uh, if you frame it properly, something about giving back. There's something about recognising the debt that you have to those whom you ca have cared for you for a long time and to be able to give something back, uh, uh, is, I think, is profoundly important. So there are, uh, there are gifts that can be, that can be gained, uh, not least, well, there's giving back and there's also the fact that people sometimes get to know aspects of their parents um, that they didn't know before, certainly in the early stages when people are begin to open up and talk in ways perhaps they haven't done before, there's a possibility that you can get to know. That can change and shift and you can discover things that you don't want to know as well, so it's complicated. Yeah, dementia, I mean, it's like many other things, it's a social illness. It looks as if it belongs to the individual, but it actually belongs to the family, and then from there into the community, into society. Uh, and there is one sense in which, in the later stages of, of dementia, the, the, the patient has an easier time, insofar as they've forgotten. They've forgotten who they are, they've forgotten what they've done. So if they're offensive, for example, to their... their, their um, the, the family, or if they've been incontinent, or whatever's happened, it's gone. Um, and so families have to carry the memory of what was and try to work out what, the, the, what that memory means in relation to what is. And that's, that's a horrible tension, a difficult tension. Um, but I think recognising that it's a social illness uh, and recognising that um, any kind of intervention needs to be focused at that level is fundamentally important. I was just going to add a joke to this, now you have a serious point, but uh, the joke that Albert Lewis Whitehead famously liked to say, he'd never been lost, he always knew where he was, and just everything else was <laughs> the social dimension of the dimension yeah. suggests to that third cell. Yeah. I was struck by how you want to hold on to the word person and the notion of personhood and, you know, bend our reflection in a way that we're more generous and what counts as a person and so forth. Um, as opposed to the strategy, of just let that word go. I mean, you know, it's not much of a biblical word. I mean, it has a kind of historical, legal depth, I guess, to the way we talk. But I mean, in the end, we could just say, no, uh, you know, she ceased to be a person years ago, but she's still my mother, she's yeah. still, you know, and, and yeah. build a conceptual scheme yeah. Yeah. how they're related to God and everyone else. That's not yeah. changed. I um, like that question. I, I no longer, you know, can write yeah. checks or own property or whatever. No, I completely agree. I'm not, I, I would, I would have, the only reason, I, well, what I, personally, I, I would just call human beings human beings. Because I think the, the problem with personhood and la personhood language is that uh, we tend to evoke it as a way of avoiding the fact that we're making pretty unpleasant decisions. Um, and I'd be quite happy just for talking about human beings. And if we have to make unpleasant decisions, let's just call them unpleasant decisions. I mean, we were talking about the other, the other day at dinner, um, uh, the way in which... Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was involved with the, the plot to kill Hitler, um, worked through what he had done. And he, he, he talks about that particular act, like many other acts, being the lesser of two evils, but still being responsible before God for that action. And I think that that's a more honest way of facing ethical dilemmas, in a sense. You, you, you've got to make a decision on a real human being. It may be the wrong decision, and you're responsible for that. I mean, it's more complicated than that. So I, I think I, the reason I use the, the language of personhood today is because that's um, to try and locate it within the kind of arguments and conversations we've had over the past three days. But no, I take your point completely, and I agree with that. 
Um, I just have a question based on more just the, the disorder that you could get uh, yeah. uh, dementia. Um, I had a step granddad, I guess the best way to explain it, um, who died of dementia uh, in late, late stages. And um, it came across the point where uh, his wife stayed uh, with him throughout their whole life. And uh, they both ended up in uh, opposite uh, care homes. And uh, before he could die, of the state of dementia, his wife had died. Okay. And uh, what, what I'm really getting at is uh, they ended up choosing to tell him about his wife dying. Yep. And uh, only a week and a half later, he died of dementia. And uh, they don't know if it was stress induced or yep. what it could be. Um, but I was wondering what your take is on, on like the reality of what's going on. Yeah. You said that dementia is a lot of it is just feeling that isolated or the stress or the the social aspect of it. Uh, do you believe you should hold the stressful information from yeah. them completely, or like completely hold it from them? That's a good question. Uh, or should you incorporate it with them over a long period of time? Because he would ask for his wife constantly before yeah. he found out that she died. And when they finally told her, uh, he pretty much just completely broke down and remembered who she was. Really? I, I don't think there's a single answer to that. I, my, one of my friends, um, mother and father, both have dementia in quite advanced stages. And um, their son uh, committed suicide uh, two years ago. He jumped out of a window. Um, and th the decision at that time was to tell them. And they told them, uh, they did tell them. And of course, uh, they were upset. Then they forgot. They had to tell them again. They were upset. They forgot. And so what you have is like a constant cycle of grief and, 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 and agony. And then and in that situation, it probably would have been better not to tell them. And, and, and it's more it's complicated. I mean, it's, it's a complicated question. So I think that the answer to your question would, be, it would depend on the circumstances and probably depend on the, the stage the person is in their uh, uh, illness experience. Um, but in relation to your granddad, it may be that that was a good thing to do. Uh, yes, he died the following week, but it may, it may well be that... that uh, having the opportunity to, to know and to grieve was helpful in healing, even if that healing ended up in, in death. So I don't think there's a... I mean, and even within the professional literature, there's a, a, a lot of uh, alternative conversation around whether you should tell somebody, whether reality is testing is the best way, and so on and so forth. But my, my suggestion would be it depends on the situation. And the key thing is knowing the person and knowing the situation. Thank you. Back to start again. 